Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you'd like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is from chapter 328. Chapter 328. At the end of January, Pierre went to Moscow and stayed in an annex of his house, which had not been burned. He called on Count Rospachin and on some acquaintances who were back in Moscow, and he intended to leave for Petersburg two days later. Everybody was celebrating the victory. Everything was bubbling with life in the ruined but reviving city. Everyone was pleased to see Pierre. Everyone wished to meet him, and everyone questioned him about what he had seen. Pierre felt particularly well disposed toward them all, but was now instinctively on his guard for fear of binding himself in any way. To all questions put to him, whether important or quite trifling, such as, where would he live, was he going to rebuild? When was he going to Petersburg, and would he mind taking a parcel for someone? He replied, Yes, perhaps, or I think so, and so on. He had heard that the Rostovs were at Kostroma, but the thought of Natasha seldom occurred to him. If it did, it was only as a pleasant memory of the distant past. He felt himself not only free from social obligations, but also from that feeling which, it seemed to him, he had aroused in himself. On the third day after his arrival, he heard from the Drubetskoys that Princess Mary was in Moscow. The death, sufferings, and last days of Prince Andrew had often occupied Pierre's thoughts, and now recurred to him with fresh vividness. Having heard at dinner that Princess Mary was in Moscow and living in her house, which had not been burned, in Votsovyevska Street, he drove that same evening to see her. On his way to the house, Pierre kept thinking of Prince Andrew, of their friendship, and of his various meetings with him, and especially of the last one at Borodino. Is it possible that he died in the bitter frame of mind he was then in? Is it possible that the meaning of life was not disclosed to him before he died? thought Pierre. He recalled Karatiev and his death, and involuntarily began to compare these two men, so different and yet so similar, and that they had both lived and both died, and in the love he felt for both of them. Pierre drove up to the house of the old prince in a most serious mood. The house had escaped the fire. It showed signs of damage, but its general aspect was unchanged. The old footman, who met Pierre with a stern face as if wishing to make the visitor feel that the absence of the old prince had not disturbed the order of things in the house, informed him that the princess had gone to her own apartments, and that she received on Sundays. "'Announce me. Perhaps she will see me,' said Pierre. "'Yes, sir,' said the man. "'Please step into the portrait gallery.' A few minutes later the footman returned with the sows, who brought word from the princess that she would be very glad to see Pierre if he would excuse her want of ceremony and come upstairs to her apartment. In a rather low room, lit by one candle, sat the princess, and with her another person dressed in black. Pierre remembered that the princess always had lady companions, but who they were and what they were like he never knew or remembered. This must be one of her companions, he thought, glancing at the lady in the black dress. The princess rose quickly to meet him and held out her hand. Yes, she said, looking at his altered face after he had kissed her hand. So this is how we meet again. He spoke of you even at the very last, she went on, 
turning her eyes from Pierre to her companion with a shyness that surprised him for an instant. I was so glad to hear of your safety. It was the first piece of good news we had received for a long time. Again, the princess glanced around to her companion with even more uneasiness in her manner and was about to add something, but Pierre interrupted her. Just imagine, I knew nothing about him, said he. I thought that he had been killed. All I know I heard at second hand from others. I only know that he fell in with the Rostovs. What a strange coincidence. Pierre spoke rapidly and with animation. He glanced once at the companion's face, saw her attentive and kindly gaze fixed on him, and as often happens when one is talking, felt somehow that this companion in the black dress was a good, kind, excellent creature who would not hinder his conversing freely with Princess Mary. But when he mentioned the Rostovs, Princess Mary's face expressed still greater embarrassment. She again glanced rapidly from Pierre's face to that of the lady in the black dress and said, Do you really not recognize her? Pierre looked again at the companion's pale, delicate face with its black eyes and peculiar mouth, and something near to him, long forgotten and more than sweet, looked at him from those attentive eyes. But no, it can't be, he thought. This stern, thin, pale face that looks so much older, it cannot be she. It merely reminds me of her. But at that moment, Princess Mary said, Natasha. And with difficulty, effort, and stress, like the opening of a door grown rusty on its hinges, a smile appeared on the face with the attentive eyes. And from that opening door came a breath of fragrance, which suffused Pierre with happiness he had long forgotten, and of which he had not been thinking especially at that moment. It suffused him, seized him, and enveloped him completely. When she smiled, doubt was no longer possible. It was Natasha, and he loved her. At that moment, Pierre involuntarily betrayed to her, to Princess Mary, and above all to himself, a secret of which he himself had been unaware. He flushed joyfully, yet with painful distress. He tried to hide his agitation. But the more he tried to hide it, the more clearly, clearer than any words could have done, did he betray to himself, to her and to Princess Mary, that he loved her. No, it's, it's only the unexpectedness of it, thought Pierre. But as soon as he tried to continue the conversation he had begun with Princess Mary, he again glanced at Natasha, and a still deeper flush suffused his face, and a still stronger agitation of mingled fear and joy seized his soul. He became confused in his speech and stopped in the middle of what he was saying. Pierre had failed to notice Natasha because he did not at all expect to see her there, but he had failed to recognize her because the change in her since he last saw her was immense. She had grown thin and pale, but that was not what made her unrecognizable. She was unrecognizable at the moment he entered because on that face whose eyes had always shone with a suppressed smile of the joy of life, now when he entered and glanced at her, there was not the least shadow of a smile. Only her eyes were kindly attentive and sadly interrogative. Pierre's confusion was not reflected by any confusion on Natasha's part, but only by the pleasure that had just perceptively lit up her whole face. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 328. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 328 Love, my sighs speak, each one a grievous thing. The rusty door opens. Before Dante could brave the icy pits of hell, or ascend the crucibles of purgatory in order to meet his beloved Beatrice in paradise, he first had to meet her. Their introduction, documented in Dante's Amorto Persimitrum, Vita Nueva, presages the great sufferings he would later endure on his path to her in the Divine Comedy. At that moment, Dante writes of their meeting, the natural spirit, which dwelleth where our nourishment is administered, began to weep, and in weeping said these words, Alas, how often shall I be disturbed from this time forth? I say that, from time forward, love quite governed my soul. If suffering is indeed the constant consort of romantic love as Dante has it, then Pierre is in trouble, deep trouble. 
For today, when he is reunited with Natasha, he is aware immediately that he is in love with her, and probably always has been. Tolstoy writes, The more he tried to hide it, the more clearly, clearer than any words could have done, did he betray to himself, to her, and to Princess Mary, that he loved her. On the one hand, we should be very happy for Pierre and for Natasha. Love is a wonderful thing. After all the pain they've been through lately, they deserve a little respite from their sorrows. On the other hand, as the infinite pages of well-forgotten teenage poetry can attest, romantic love is also the author of unspeakable heartbreak and misery. Love, Dante writes in the Vita Nuova, also gathers to such power in me that my sighs speak each one a grievous thing. Pierre doesn't need any of that. He's already been hurt by Helene. Further, he's only freshly entered into the blissful state of detachment. As we read earlier in today's chapter, he now moves forward well disposed towards the world, but instinctively on guard for fear of binding himself in any way. This is a practical application of the intellectual stoic case for detachment we've so frequently written about in A Year of War and Peace. But the brain, we must remember, is the most overrated organ. The heart, quite literally, flexes its muscle and displays its power over the mind. How is Pierre to resist his attraction to Natasha? I mean, really, the passage where we watch him fall in love is one of the great romantic passages in all of world literature. Quote, Pierre looked again at the companion's pale, delicate face with its black eyes and peculiar mouth, and something near to him, long forgotten and more than sweet, looked at him from those attentive eyes. But no, it cannot be, he thought. This stern, thin, pale face that looks so much older, it cannot be she. It merely reminds me of her. But at that moment, Princess Mary said, Natasha, and with difficulty, effort, and stress, like the opening of a door grown rusty on its hinges, a smile appeared on the face with the attentive eyes, and from that opening door came a breath of fragrance which suffused Pierre with a happiness he had long forgotten, and of which he had not even begun thinking, especially at that moment. It suffused him, seized him, and enveloped him completely. When she smiled, doubt was no longer possible. It was Natasha, and he loved her. End quote. Clearly, there's little to help him, or her. The Stoics have precious little to say about romantic love, though it's safe to say they'd be opposed to love rather than reason governing the soul. In order, then, for Pierre to maintain his newfound mental tranquility and indulge his feelings for Natasha, it's probably best for him to adopt a romance of moderation. That might not sound sexy, but it does sound smart. Daily Meditation Once exceed moderation and the most delightful things may become the most undelightful. Epictetus in Chiridion. All right, so that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 328 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 329 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.